Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Deverna. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate here at uh, IU, um, and I'm really happy to welcome everybody to the Observatory on Social Media's Awesome Speakers event. Uh, as we usually do, before we get started, I'll just sort of introduce the series, the observatory, um, and then I'll introduce our speaker for the day um, to get things going uh, in a little more interesting content. So um, for those of you who are learning about the observatory for the first time, the Observatory in Social Media is a, a joint project of the Luddy School of Informatics, Computing, and Engineering, and the Media School at Indiana University. Um, so the observatory uh, is an inter interdisciplinary research group that is interested in really um, all things at the intersection of media and technology. Uh, and as the name uh, suggests, we have a particular focus on uh, social media. Uh, we conduct rigorous academic research, build analytical tools and software for both scientists and journalists, and work to educate the next generation of computationally skilled media professionals. Um, so if, you know, if you're curious to learn more, uh, the link to our website is the bottom there, awesome.iu.edu, um, and you can find more about our latest research tools or, or really anything else going on. Uh, with the observatory. And um, the uh, Awesome Speakers virtual event is, is essentially meant to be kind of an extension of the interdisciplinary mission of the observatory, um, which basically consists of a series of talks from some of the brightest researchers and scholars who are working to rigorously understand how social media, the internet, and technology impact the world today. Um, and we've had a bunch of, of talks in the past. We've been doing this for a couple of semesters now. You can find links to those videos on the event page, uh, the, the link here at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and we also have some of uh, a few more talks left, left for this semester. Um, I think if you're interested in today's talk, um, you'll find some interesting stuff there on, um, on that web page as well. So uh, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sandra gonzalez Bailan. Sandra is the Carolyn Marvin Professor of Communication at the Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and there she also has a secondary appointment in the Department of Sociology uh, and is the, the director of the Center for Information Networks and Democracy. Prior to joining Penn, she was a research fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute. Uh, she completed her doctoral degree in Nuffield College at the University of Oxford and her undergraduate studies at the University of Barcelona. Her research agenda lies at the intersection of computational social science and polit political communication. And her applied work uh, looks at how online networks shape exposure to information with implications for how we think about political engagement, mobilization dynamics, information diffusion, and the consumption of news. Uh, some of her work has been uh, has appeared in journals like PNAS, Science, Nature, Political Communication, the Journal of Communication, and Social Networks, uh, among many others. And I'll also just note that she is the author of the book, Decoding the Social World, uh, as well as co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of Network Communication. Uh, so it's really my uh, my pleasure and, and, and uh, excited. I'm really sort of excited to pass things off. Um, but I'll just remind everybody of the typical structure, um, which is that we'll uh, Sandra will present for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have kind of an open uh, discussion for the last 15 minutes or so. Uh, so you can leave questions in the chat if you like, uh, and we can sort of address them later. But we really sort of encourage everybody to kind of save them for the end, and then we can have a nice discussion um, uh, at the end. And now uh, is, uh, I'm going to ask that everybody welcome Sandra as warmly as we can through this sort of Zoom format. Um, and Sandra, I'm going to stop sharing and you'll sort of take over. Okay, let me see. Okay, can you see my notes now? No, we're good. <laughs> no, awesome. We're good. <laughs> Perfect. <All right>. So. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Matt, for for the for the introduction, also for the invitation to join you. You you make the speakers feel very good just by inviting them, right? Because who doesn't want to be <laughs> awesome? So so thank you about that. Um, my plan for this talk is uh, to discuss how algorithmic choices and social choices interact on social media to determine how we get exposed to. Um, uh, political information and the big picture. Um, Motivating this research relates to the role that information plays in democracies and to the fact that the quality of our democracies um, relies uh, on the quality of the information that we consume. Uh, there is a lot of talk these days, as you know, about how digital technologies are challenging the foundations of our democracies. Um, the truth is that communication technologies have always challenged our normative expectations um, of um, the 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 role that information should play in a democracy. Communication technologies have long provided a broadcasting platform to propaganda efforts, 
They have allowed the substitution of high quality news with low quality content. And in general, they have helped instill priorities in the mind of the public that do not always align with what's of public interest. And this, this has always been an issue. But digital technologies and social media in particular have created a new category uh, of challenges. Um, one uh, prominent, let me see if I can click okay. One prominent challenge is that social media have eroded uh, one of the most important mechanisms through which traditional news media enforce political accountability uh, by blurring the boundaries between legitimate and illegitimate um, information and between credible and unreliable sources. These are some of the many, many research articles that have tried to characterize in recent years the sort of information disorders that are challenging the democratic process, including the spread of rumors um, or the, the spread of misinformation, and that have tried to provide solutions and suggestions uh, on how to address this problem. The problem of misinformation, of course, has two elements to it, right? This uh, one element, which refers to the supply of information, is about prevalence uh, or about how common misinformation is in the uh, media environment. And understanding this element requires adopting sort of the bird's eye view um, and analyzing on the aggregate how much misinformation there is um, out there. And then the other element refers to the demand side of the equation, and it is about exposure and susceptibility. In other words, it is about who is more likely to consume that information and engage with it. And this requires a focus on the individual and their characteristics, including demographics or psychological propensities. These are just, again, a couple of examples of research that has tried to assess the prevalence of misinformation on social media or on, 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 on you know, the web more generally. And so for instance, a network figure here comes from uh, Greenberg, Greenberg et al. And uh, it measures co-exposure to news on Twitter. Each note represents a political news site and orange notes uh, encode fake news. Um, and so essentially what the analysis of these sort of co-exposure network revealed is that fake news sources have a niche interest, right? Users exposed to this type of content, which is a small fraction of all the news content circulating on the platform, where a minority of heavily overlapping individuals. In other words, when we look at the prevalence um, of news and false stories, we can identify patterns like this. That is, we can identify pockets um, of unreliable news sources and also who is more likely to gravitate, gravitate uh, towards those sources at the population level. Then there is the question of susceptibility and exposure and uh, of the demographic correlates that explain who is more likely to engage with political news or political misinformation and um, sort of the types of behavioral interventions that are more likely to be successful in discouraging engagement with false news. Again, supply and demand are in constant interaction, right? You cannot understand one without understanding the other, even if often for convenience, we sort of break this feedback loop apart to be able to run our experiments or design our research in a feasible manner. And yet, this constant interaction between supply and demand is not the only feedback loop that is beating, so to speak, at the heart of, of the information ecosystem. There is another loop matching individuals to content, and that is the curation loop. That is the process by which um, individuals are presented with a subset of all the information that they could see. And you know, this is a process that learns from how individuals engage with that information so that in the next iteration, uh, it incorporates that knowledge into making new selections or new suggestions uh, uh, for users. Now, this is a process in which both social choices and algorithmic systems play a role, right? Social and algorithmic forms of curation allow us to um, select and organize information. And what matters is that this process often results in different, potentially to a, to a greater or lesser degree, this process often results in different information realities for different people. 
And so the research that I want to discuss today was designed to measure the outcomes um, of, of this process, the consequences of this feedback loop that is part algorithmic uh, and part social. And the idea is also to be able to measure those outcomes on the aggregate at the level of the information ecosystem. Now, why is it important that we focus on aggregated outcomes? Well, because it is only on this aggregate level that we can see things that we wouldn't be able to see otherwise. We have research, for instance, suggesting that when it comes to political content and political news, there is an asymmetry in terms of political bias. That is, there is more content that leans uh, right in, in terms of the ideological spectrum uh, than content leaning left. And the question is why? Is it because of platform mechanisms like algorithmic systems, or is it because of social mechanisms like selective exposure, homophily? but also because of different supply uh, volumes. And, and so the answer to this question of um, what's more important in social technical systems, the social or the technological, the answer to this question is both. Um, it kind of echoes the old sociological tension between structure and agency, or, or the question of do people jump or are they pushed, right? And But I guess my main point in this talk is going to be that we can only answer this question, we can only, only try to resolve this tension if we take into account the complexity of the entire system. And I know that I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but um, you know, if we only pay attention to individual level behavior, we are likely to miss the aggregated unintended outcomes that are likely to arise from individual interactions in a given environment, given how that environment is designed. This is not that different really from what Schelling emphasized many, many, many years ago already in his book, Micro Motives and Macro Behavior. This is a book that I was obsessed with as a grad student. And so if any of you grad students haven't read it yet, I highly recommend that you do. So what Schelling argued in this book is that if we only pay attention to individual motivations or revealed preferences, we are unlikely to see or understand the aggregated consequences um, of their behavior and their interactions, consequences that may not be aligned with or explainable by their original intentions. And so what you have on the screen uh, is Schelling's classic model of racial segregation. Um, it is a very simple model, uh, but it's powerful enough to show two key things. One is that aggregated patterns often arise as an unintended consequence of individual behaviors. Um, and so essentially what this means is that if we were to take a snapshot of the aggregated patterns, we would probably draw the wrong conclusions about the underlying mechanisms. And then the second thing that he showed is that small differences at the individual level can make big differences on the aggregate in a way that we wouldn't be able to anticipate just by looking at the individual parts. Now, the paper that I want to discuss today echoes those two lessons in that we study patterns on the aggregate that are unlikely to result from anyone's individual intention, uh, but that respond nonetheless to how a social system facilitates and also constrains information dynamics. Um, in this paper, we talk also about segregation. We talked about, about a different type of segregation than the one Schelling considered, uh, but it echoes the same spirit. You've probably seen this paper before. This was published um, last July as, as part of the initial package of articles that came out of the US 2020 Facebook and Instagram election study. Many of the collaborators in this project have been awesome speakers too. I know David um, uh, was here a few weeks ago and he alluded to this paper. So I thought that I would discuss it in depth. Uh, the other three papers that were published in this package are experimental. This is the only study in this initial group that is purely observational and sort of focuses, as I said, on, on the aggregate level of the information ecosystem that Meta created around the 2020 election. Uh, again, this research was part of a larger collaboration that I suspect you've all heard about, so I'm not going to uh, say too much about it. But I do want to give you a sense of the timeline we followed to make this research happen. I guess I want to emphasize how long it took to complete the project, if only to encourage whoever's in the audience to always persevere. Uh, we started the research in early 2020, partly as a continuation of an initiative that um, some of you may also know, Social Science One. This was a project that was created to facilitate industry academia collaboration. Uh, to study the impact of social media on society and specifically 
uh, to make data available to researchers who do not work for social media companies. And so out of social science, one grew this project that I want to discuss today, which consists on 16 different studies that were uh, pre-registered in October of 2020. Um, in case some of you are not familiar with pre-registration. Uh, um, it is essentially the practice of documenting your research plan at the beginning of the study and, and sort of storing that plan in a repository, in our case, the Open Science Framework Registry, as part of ongoing efforts to promote and encourage transparency in research. In this case, it was also a contract of sorts with Meta, right? So these uh, pre-analysis plans were our way of saying, this, this is the data we need to answer the questions we deem important. And so unless we get this data, we will not continue in this project, um, sort of. Um, and so some of the studies um, that we pre-registered, as I mentioned, some are observational, some are experimental, some focus on the analysis of on-platform exposure to information, some also consider of platform effects. And so the paper that I wanna to discuss today is one of the observational projects that centers on, on platform exposure and that specifically um, considers this question of algorithmic curation versus social curation uh, and selection. So our main goal when designing this project was to be able to answer one big question. And the question is, do conservatives and liberals consume different news on the platform? Uh, this question echoes the concern that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that a widening gap in the political information that conservatives and liberals consume can exacerbate the political frictions that already exist in US society. And so if algorithmic systems are contributing to amplify that gap, we should know. In our pre-analysis plan, we pre-registered more specific questions around the existence of segregation um, in news consumption on Facebook during the 2020 election. And so we had specifically four areas of interest. The first is the role that algorithmic curation played in shaping exposure to specific types of news. Um, we also wanted to see if levels of segregation varied during the course of the election. A third important element of how we were thinking about uh, the data was to be able to separate exposure to news stories from exposure to news sources. And the logic behind this is that, and I think David talked a little bit about this, if we think of news consumption as a diet, uh, which is one of the most used and abused uh, metaphors that <laughs> we use to understand uh, news consumption, if we think of it as a diet, then the diet online resembles more a buffet style kind of eating than the set menu style of eating, right? And so what I mean by this is that on social media, news sources, sort of the brand, often becomes less relevant than the specific stories that we see and interact with. Um, and so we wanted to be able to separate exposure to a source like the New York Times from exposure to specific stories within that source. And then we were also interested in measuring segregation in exposure to unreliable content um, and assessing whether unreliable content was more likely to be seen by conservatives or liberals. All right, so in order to answer our main question, do conservatives and liberals consume different news on Facebook, we used three measures. Um, the first measure we used is the segregation index, which is a metric that has been used before in the study of online news exposure, and that is adapted from research on residential segregation. The idea here is to be able to determine if Facebook's news ecosystem reveals patterns um, of ideological segregation like cities reveal patterns of residential segregation, right? And so following this past work, we use the isolation index, which captures whether conservatives disproportionately see news domains or news stories that have mostly conservative audiences. And so the first summation is the visit weighted average exposure of conservatives to conservatives across all news domains or news stories, depending on the level of analysis. And then the second summation is the visit weighted average exposure of liberal to conservatives. So this index ranges um, from zero to one, it is zero if there is no segregation in news exposure, and it is one if uh, conservatives only see domains or stories with audiences that are 100% conservatives and, and, and vice versa, if liberals only see domains or stories that are 100% liberal. Now, of course, the question is, where does news exposure on Facebook fall in between these two extremes? 
Then we look at the news sources and the news stories circulating on the platform, and we measured how homogeneous their audiences are. And so in ideological terms, right? So here we use another score, uh, what we call the favorability scores, which equals one when a given domain or a given URL has an audience formed exclusively by conservatives, and it is minus one when it has an audience formed exclusively by liberals. And so if the segregation index offers a summary statistic of the whole information ecosystem, these scores allow us to analyze the distribution of domains and URLs as they fall in this continuum of liberal leaning or conservative leaning audiences. And then the third thing we did was to analyze co-exposure patterns. And what this means is that we look at how many of the users who were exposed to say the New York Times uh, were also exposed to say the Washington Post. And the analysis of these networks allows us to identify clusters or pockets of new sources around which audiences congregated on the platform. Another way to think about these three measures is as operating at different levels of aggregation, right? So the segregation index is a summary statistic that helps us characterize um, sort of the whole information ecosystem. The favorability scores are applied to specific domains or URLs, and they allow us to measure the audience uh, ideological composition. So whether the audience of a specific news domain or a specific news story leans conservative or liberal. And then we have the co-exposure networks, which operate at the meso scale. So between the level of the information ecosystem and sort of the level of individual domains and news stories. And so at this meso scale, we can see clustering that we wouldn't be able to see just by looking at the other two levels. Okay, so now that I have defined the main metrics, let me tell you about the main levels of analysis. Um, so one of the main contributions of this work is that we track segregation levels down what we call the funnel of engagement. So we have data on the inventory of content that users could potentially see and know that this inventory changes from user to user depending on their network on the platform, right? So depending on who they follow, which groups uh, they join, which page pages they like, etc. Then we have data on the content that users actually see on their news feeds after um, the process of algorithmic curation. And note here that what users see on the on the news feed is not only a function of algorithmic curation, but also of other factors like time spent on the platform or the speed with which they scroll down their feeds. But nonetheless, algorithmic curation, and in particular, the algorithmic system that we call Newsfeed, uh, plays an important role in determining what people see out of everything they could potentially see, right? And then we have data on the content with which users decide to engage. And this is, again, this is a subset of all the information that is selected to be displayed on their feeds, right? So I may scroll down and then like something and then scroll down and then retweet or reshare something. And so that would be how the level at which we use user engagement, right? And what we do is measure, essentially we measure segregation at each of these three levels of analysis. Another set of analyses disaggregates content as a function of who posted that content, right? And essentially we have three different layers here. We have content posted by users, content posted by pages, and then con content posted in groups. And so the question is, do segregation levels vary depending on whether the content was posted by users, uh, by pages, or in groups? And do we find similar changes as we move down the funnel of engagement for each of these three types of content? Now, the reason why we differentiate between these three different surfaces is that, of course, their network positions are very different or, or their, their ability for broadcasting is, is very different. And then finally, we also look at whether segregation levels vary for untrustworthy or false content. And I'm going to tell you in a second how we identify this content. OK, so um, let me tell you more explicitly about the data. Our main unit of analysis, as I mentioned, are political news domains and political news URLs, or so specific news stories. We do not have any individual level data. All the data that we analyze are aggregated at the domain or URL level, but the activity we analyze includes all users who were based in the US during our observation period, which goes from September 1st, 2020 to February 1st, 2021. And as another privacy measure, we only analyze URLs and domains that were posted more than 100 times. Uh, and so this is so that we can reverse engineer the identity of the posters. 
Uh, we use meta, civic, and news classifiers to identify posts containing um, URLs that were classified as political uh, or as news. And so what we analyze is at the intersection of these two classifiers. We also use Meta's ideology classifier to determine the audience composition of news domains and news URLs. And so we have a very extensive appendix uh, uh, in the paper um, where we do present some performance metrics for all these classifiers. And then we have Meta's third party fact checking program, which allowed us to identify news stories rated as false and untrustworthy domains, right? So the ratings at the URL level come from a list of fact checking organizations that include Snopes, Reuters, the Washington Post, Fact Checker, FactCheck.org, uh, and PolitiFact. And so essentially, we just take their ratings when a news story is considered false. And then the untrustworthy label at the domain level um, help, helps us identify domains that repeatedly share misinformation. And in particular, we labeled a domain as untrustworthy if two or more of their political news stories or URLs were rated as false by Meta's independent fact checkers from the beginning of the misinformation repeat offender program, which uh, began in August of 2018. Um, this is a visual summary of the data uh, that we analyze in our levels of analysis. So again, our analysis center on three different levels. We have data on exposure to domains, which allows us to calculate segregation metrics at the news source level. And uh, we also have information on URLs, which helps us um, calculate segregation metrics at the news story level. And we have also data on the co-exposure networks where nodes are domains um, or news stories and the edges encode the number of uh, unique users um, that are exposed to a given pair. And again, the analysis of co-exposure networks allows us to determine whether there is notable clustering in exposure to sources and within sources in exposure to stories. And so in these schematic examples, in, 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 if you look at subpanels um, A to C, for instance, these examples do not show strong evidence of clustering, but the networks in subpanels D and E do. In panel B, you have, again, the schematic representation of the funnel of engagement, so from, pot from potential exposure to actual exposure to engagement. The numbers indicate the levels of analysis implied in our research question. So one is, are news inventories ideologically segregated? A second question is, does segregation increase after algorithmic curation? And uh, the third question is, does segregation increase based on what content users choose to engage with? And then in panel C and D, we have the number of news domains um, categorized as untrustworthy or trustworthy, and the number of news URLs rated false and not rated false by Meta's third-party fact checkers. And as you can see, um, you know, there's only a tiny fraction of all the content circulating on the platform that was rated false, and also a tiny fraction of domains or news sources that uh, uh, were classified as untrustworthy. Um, um, I think that if I remember correctly, the proportion of political news URLs rated false um, was 0.2% for news stories and about 3% uh, for domains. Okay, so let me quickly mention here something that I think it's important. And that is that the inventory with which we start sort of the final of engagement is itself the result of another curation process uh, that relates to the formation of the underlying network that users build on the platform, right? So this network is a reflection of users' pre-existing ties and interests, but also the result of algorithmic recommendations on whom to follow, as well as uh, platform affordances, um, like the existence of pages and groups, right? Like this is a design choice, uh, and we do not have data on any of this. We only know what content is fed into the inventory for each user, that's our starting point. But what generates the inventory is also a complex system of social and algorithmic uh, choices. So here we look at two of our metrics, uh, the segregation index um, and the uh, audience polarization scores at the domain and URL levels. And so if you look at panel A, what we see here is that um, the segregation score is consistently higher at the URL level, suggesting that there are information curation practices within news stories that would get masked uh, if we were to aggregate the data at the domain level and only analyze that. Um, 
just to give you a benchmark to assess the magnitude of these scores, this is a figure that we show in the supplementary materials uh, where we compare the segregation scores for the same set of individuals. Um, so, uh, you know, for a subset of Facebook users who agreed to participate in the study, uh, we also have web tracking data. So we could calculate on platform and off platform segregation in news consumption. And as you can see, segregation on Facebook was at least three times larger than on the web. Back to this figure, if you look at panels B and C, here we show that the segregation goes up as we move down the funnel of engagement, which suggests to us that algorithmic and social amplification both contribute to segregation. If you really pay attention though, you will see that the difference between potential and engaged audiences is only visible at the domain level. In the case of URLs, so news stories, these two lines, the potential audience and the actual audience, they overlap. Um, and you know, some could interpret this as suggesting that algorithms play no role in directing people to specific news stories. But we have additional information that we show in, in again, in the supplementary materials that complicate this picture. And so in this figure, for instance, uh, we show that the process of algorithmic curation operates differently only for groups, right? So for users and pages, we see again, an increase of segregation levels as we move down the funnel of engagement, um, but we don't see that for groups. Um, and, um, you know, curation is different for groups. Uh, this is the one surface on Facebook that is the target of many content moderation policies. But unfortunately, given the nature of our data aggregated, uh, you know, we don't have individual level data, we cannot unpack this further. Uh, but uh, I found this particularly interesting in terms of casting some light on uh, content moderation practices. Back to this figure again, if you now look at the lower row, um, here we show the ideology scores. And so again, uh, the favorability scores are close to minus one when the audience of a particular domain or story is more liberal and they get closer to plus one, uh, the more homogeneously conservative the audience is. And so if you look at panel D, we see that overall audiences that are consuming political news on Facebook have a right leaning slant. So all scores are above the zero line. If we look at panels E and F, which uh, show the density plots, we see that the distribution is substantially skewed towards the right. And again, this means that there are more domains and more URLs that are being favored by very conservative audiences, very homogeneously conservative audiences. And so the vertical bl uh, black lines um, in, in these plots mark the quantiles of the distribution. Uh, to give you a sense of what these domains are, in this figure, we um, visualize the variation of URL ideology scores within domains for the top 100 by views. And so uh, essentially this figure suggests that there is some variation in the ideology scores at the news story level. So again, this is evidence of selection within domains, right? So you know, uh, liberal audiences may engage uh, or, you know, with certain news stories published, say, by the New York Times, but other uh, audiences of the same news source may engage with a different set of, audio of news stories. And so this is what explains this variation. Um, overall, however, most uh, scores are either below or above the zero line, which suggests that, you know, even though there's some variation, there's some consistency also. Uh, in, in the composition of, of news audiences. Um, but what I thought was very interesting in this figure also is kind of the corner, the, the lower right corner, right? Like, so the few domains um, that are highly homogeneous in terms of their conservative audiences, right? And so uh, there is a sizable group of domains with consistently extreme conservative scores. And um, this is also the corner where, according to our results, most misinformation lies. And by the way, a reminder, this is the top 100 list of news domains on Facebook um, uh, in terms of views. If we were to plot a similar uh, 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 figure using, say, web data, we would see a different list, right? And so these are domains that are pretty, most of them peripheral, the ones in this right-leaning corner, right? They're very peripheral on the web. Uh, they rank very high in terms of reach on, on, on Facebook. Uh, 
And so I just mentioned that this is the corner where most misinformation lies. In this figure, we look at the audience composition of untrustworthy domains and false URLs, again, according to the ratings of Meta's third party fact checkers. Um, the density plots in panels A and B show that most domains that are categorized untrustworthy are favored by audiences that are predominantly conservative. About 76% of untrustworthy domains have audiences that are conservative on average, meaning they have ideology scores that are larger than zero. And a reminder that a domain is labeled as untrustworthy if two or more of their stories were rated false by third party fact checkers. And then on the lower row uh, on panel C and D, we have the same information, but for URLs. And, and here the percentages are even higher, right? Here there is about 97% uh, of false URLs that have audiences that are conservative on average. And again, this is a very tiny fraction of all the news content that was circulating on the platform, but you know it's consumed predominantly by conservative audiences. Um, this concentration of uh, misleading content in the most conservative pocket um, of Facebook um, Facebook's information environment can also be seen in the analysis of the co-exposure networks. And so remember that uh, in these networks, nodes are domains or URLs and the ties encode the number of users that are co-exposed to a given pair of uh, sources or news stories. And again, a reminder that the analysis of these co-exposure networks allows us to determine whether we observe uh, evidence of segregation, even if we know nothing about the ideology of users, right? The presence of clusters in this network is behavioral evidence of selective exposure, which in this case is shaped by users, social networks, and also by the newsfeed algorithm. And so what we did here was to analyze these co-exposure networks. We used a community detection approach to identify the presence of these clusters. And in this figure, we only plot the top three communities um, sized in terms of views um, for each weekly uh, network. So we aggregate these networks weekly, we identify the communities, and here we're just plotting the top three communities. Each of these, is formed by domains and URLs that have a higher overlap of audiences internally than externally, that is, uh, with domains or URLs in other communities. Once we had these communities, we calculated the mean ideology score for each of them. So the average score for the domains and URLs classified in the same community. And what these revealed is that the clustering that was identified only in terms of co-exposure behavior maps pretty well onto the two sides of the ideological continuum, right? There is clearly a cluster of domains and URLs um, that liberal users are co-exposed to. And then there is a cluster on the conservative side. And in fact, uh, what we see again is that there's a major asymmetry between the left and the right, right? New sources and stories consumed by conservat uh, conservative audiences depart more clearly from the zero line of cross-cutting exposure. And what this means again is that audiences are more homogeneously conservative and as a result, more isolated. Um, uh, these outlets on the right are the outlets that post a higher fraction of news stories rated false uh, by the third party fact checking program. This is colored and coded in the figure. And um, again, what this means is that conservative audiences are um, uh, more exposed to unreliable news. So what does this all mean? So essentially in this paper, we show that ideological segregation is high uh, on Facebook, uh, at least compared to the web. And it increases as we shift from potential exposure to actual exposure to engagement. There is an asymmetry between conservative and liberal audiences with a substantial corner of the news ecosystem consumed exclusively by conservatives and most misinformation as identified by the third party fact checking program exists within this homogeneously conservative corner, which has no equivalent on the liberal side. And so in general, we find that sources favored by conservative audiences were more prevalent on Facebook's new ecosystem than those favored by liberals. And why does uh, it all matter? Uh, well, I want to go back to my initial statement of the um, importance of adopting sort of the bird's eye view. Um, if there is one thing that we show in this paper is that misinformation is a problem that affects mostly a restricted group of people that are very homogeneous, but also outliers. I think this is also consistent with what past work has shown. 
We also show that some of the affordances on the platform, and in particular, the existence of pages, give oxygen to this type of content and much more visibility to sources that would be much more peripheral elsewhere, for instance, uh, the web, peripheral in terms of their ability to reach people. In other words, we find that the uh, curation algorithms uh, that operate on Facebook complicate the loop that connects supply and demand and results in an asymmetrical information ecosystem where most of the misinformation um, thrives uh, on one side of the ideological divide. And even though this is a purely observational study and we cannot unpack the causal mechanisms given the nature of the data that we analyze, the results are still useful to identify a property of the information ecosystem, right? This is not a property that we can uncover by looking at demographics or other individual characteristics or psychological propensities. And therefore, this is something that is going to be difficult to tackle if we only design interventions that operate at the individual level. Um, Next steps. Okay, let me quickly tell you what we're working on now, uh, because there are still several projects in this collaboration that are in the pipeline. So in the research that I just told you about, we pay attention to exposure and how we select kind of the information that we decide to engage with. We are currently working on revisions to a paper where we shift attention to patterns of diffusion within the platform and sort of um, to, to how content posted was shared and reshared. In this paper, we pay attention to any type of content. So we are not only paying attention to political news. Um, and so essentially we are reconstructing diffusion events as, as hierarchical trees, hierarchical networks. And through the analysis of these networks, we reconstruct the diffusion pathways of all types of content, including misinformation. And of course, here, algorithmic systems play a role. The one thing we are paying special attention in this paper is on how content moderation policies, which shifted drastically during our observation period, also shaped the emergence of these diffusion trees. And so some of these content moderation uh, policies have been covered in the press under the rubric of like break glass measures. Um, and so hopefully I'll be able to share the results of this study soon. In the meantime, let me just mention that all the replication materials for the study that I just uh, discussed, but also the other three studies that have already been published, all the data are available as part of the social media archive at ICPSR, um, which is an international consortium of academic institutions that maintains um, a data archive. So if you wanted to get access to this data, there's a mechanism already in place for you to be able to do so. And with this, I'm going to end so that we can um, start the the discussion. Just Thank stop. you. Sure. Thank you so much for uh, a lot of, of material cover. We definitely appreciate that. Um, and yes, please, everybody, uh, put your claps together. Um, so yeah, the floor is going to open up. Um, please, I think typically what we do is you know, you can sort of raise your hand in Zoom, and then I will uh, sort of call on people. Um, and I guess if you have any questions you want to leave in the chat, you can do that as well. Um, they may be sort of a, a softball to get the get things going. I'm, I'm curious just about the your thoughts about the the collaboration with Meta. And if you talk a little bit about, you know, anything that maybe was an obvious, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about sort of the, the long, you know, sort of an arduous long time period. Um, and I think there's been some sort of think pieces about like, you know, what does this mean if we have to have this kind of collaboration? Um, did you find it to be, you know, more or less a positive experience, negative experience, anything that you wish could have been changed? Um, I think Josh has talked a lot about how, you know, you seem like you got more or less everything you wanted. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was a great experience. I learned a ton working with uh, the rest of the academics, but also uh, the the partners at Meta, the data scientists. Um, th it took a long time because there were many quality checks in the process, and and you know, and many um, mechanisms to make sure that what we would ultimately report was based on the best possible data. Um, uh, that we could get considering the kind of provisions to protect privacy. So I was mm. 
um, you know, I, I, I wish we would have been able to access, especially for this paper, as I mentioned, the underlying topology, the network that determines what goes into the inventory, also in sociological terms, right? Like, so social networks, mm -hmm. homophily, we couldn't access that because network is very, um, sense, you know, it, it, it contains a lot of information that could potentially identify individuals. So, so the one thing I wish, you know, but this is kind of trying to reverse time, which is uh, 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 impossible. <laughs> you know, the, the the you know the more you work on this data, uh, and in hindsight, uh, there's a lot of things that we learned that would have probably kind of pushed us to ask a, a, a slightly different questions, and we were confined by the pre-analysis plans, right? And so. I just mentioned in the in the very last slide. Now that we're working on this other paper on information diffusion, uh, you know, we had no idea uh, that the, about the range of measures under this break glass interventions. We had no idea what kind of measures would be implemented on platform on the platform that would go above and beyond what the newsfeed algorithm does, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. the reason why we learned about the existence of these measures is through, I think, a leaked social media, kind of the House Committee social media, January 6th social media report that provides a very clear timeline of interventions. Uh, mm -hmm. One of which, for instance, is called the virality circuit breaker, right? Which is, as the name implies, it, it was intended to prevent uh, the, you know, viral, the diffusion of, the viral diffusion of certain type of content misinformation. And so obviously in hindsight, it wouldn't have been great to know that these things would happen so that we could have designed research in a particular way, but we didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, you know, having those pre-analysis plans uh, you know, it's a super important part of encouraging transparency and sort of in our case, it was also, as I mentioned, a contract of sorts, meaning before we got access to any data, uh, before we started kind of setting up the system to access the data, you know, we agreed on the questions that the academic team considered crucial to answer. And, um, but, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, we were probably pre-registered slightly different studies, but of course no one can do that. So, <laughs> so, and so <laughs> yeah. what's my hope? My hope is that this is just one stepping stone that we can continue doing. So even though I'm not very optimistic, given recent developments and data restrictions, right? But so that's the whole point of cumulative research so that we can learn mm. and keep on asking more refined questions, but that requires access to data. And I'm not sure that this is going to happen again, right? At least not for the 2024 election. <laughs> no. Yeah. So I yeah, it's a big ask, permission. So. <laughs> exactly. If I, I was going to say quickly that yeah, I totally agree. There was this one piece on you know, uh, sorry, what is it? Um, what was the headline? You know, uh, access by permission. That yeah, we we were granted mm -hmm. permission to access the data. That's the reality of it. And so we, I wish it were different. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. But of course, you know, it's I think we've all learned a lot from from the different papers, and and we're looking forward to seeing some more in the future. Um, I guess one uh, sort of particular question. Uh, so you guys did some sort of uh, like prevalence check of in terms of uh, the, the number of false URLs and show that that is a pretty small percentage. Um, I'm curious if there was any discussion about, so in, in my mind, uh, maybe like a potentially bigger bucket. And I think what a lot of people are not necessarily more concerned, but um, I think they expected there to be more of would be sort of just like generally misleading content. Um, and so what, is that something that they consider or are they just sort of, based on their, um, you know, the fact checking system that it's not sort of a label that they apply. Uh, so you couldn't do it. Um, so yeah, if you could talk more about that, I'd be interested. So so this is a decision that the academic team kind of made also, right? Like, so we have the, the labels provided by the third party fact checker partners, which is a network of organizations. So it's a crowdsource um, system independent from Meta, uh, even though the mechanisms through which these organizations identify the news that they check for whether they are forced or not, it's not entirely clear because each of them has their own mechanisms, right? So factcheck.org mm -hmm. it was based next to Annenberg where I work, right? Like, um, you know, they have their own mechanisms and then, you know, the Meta also kind of sends some of some of the content that gets flagged on the platform for them to, to fact check them. So that's one, that's one um, label we use. But then there's the, this untrustworthy label, um, you know, I think it's more comprehensive in terms of identifying potentially problematic content because uh, and again, a reminder that untrustworthy sources are sources that publish at least two news stories rated false since uh, mm. the beginning of you know um, since 2018, I think, uh, or 19. I don't remember now. Um, and so you know that I think expands the net a little bit in terms of you know mm -hmm. I, I, 
allow you to monitor potentially problematic content. Um, it is the Achilles heel of any research project in this domain. Who, dis who gets to decide what's true, what's false, what's problematic? <laughs> And I don't yeah. think we have a consensus or the magical solution. Um, and so my own personal opinion is that it's not that misguided to crowdsource the, this mm -hmm. decision, um, which is in a way what we did. Um, rather than us okay. deciding, okay, this is false, this is true, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, no, it makes sense. And and when you put it that way, I think now think of the sort of the bounds of sort of the false prevalence uh, measurement and then you're on the untrustworthy untrustworthy is sort of the higher lower bound so that yeah. totally makes sense um and you talked to, you talked a little bit about um sort of like the the top three communities and you have sort of a higher concentration um of misinformation and sort of leaning on the right um so uh, yeah i mean how do you think about this in terms of like content moderation um, right, so so this is this, this that there's this idea of this sort of this long tail of users, a very small group of people who are being exposed to a lot of the problematic content. Um, this seems to suggest that some sort of content moderation should be focused on a small set of users, but then I don't know. There's sort of it becomes sort of less of a sort of equal application of of the system against people. So how how do we how do we think about this? Um, I don't know if that's a great, well-phrased question, but hopefully you understand what I mean. Yeah, I think I know what you're getting at. So I think most of the content moderation policies on Facebook are directed at pages and groups. Users are rarely ever, you know, like, so the, the newsfeed algorithm um, has mechanisms to demote content that is considered problematic. Again, it's not totally transparent, but, you know, if you just read the documentation. Mm -hmm. it, it, I, th I think to me, the key is now we know several studies suggests that that's the case across social media platforms. It's a minority of highly engaged users who provide most of the problematic content and they, there are concerted efforts to push that content. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And so this is the sort of dynamic that would require uh, reconstructing the sort of networks that are easier, that were easier in the past to reconstruct with Twitter data, right? Like, so th this kind of, um, information coordination campaigns sort of, you know, and, and that requires reconstructing the network and who these problematic users, this minority of users, how they are embedded in the overall structure and how their uh, activity um, in terms of posting and reposting um, kind of percolates or who gets exposed to that content that wouldn't be exposed otherwise. And this is where, in, in the case of this collaboration, that was the sort of data that was impossible to get. Again, for good reasons, right? There's <laughs> privacy that we should be, you know, um, that we should be protected. Uh, it's highly sensitive information, but I think that would that would have been the the sort of data that would have allowed us to dig deeper into not only identifying how these users are kind of located in the larger structure, but also potentially discuss avenues for intervention that would build firewalls around those users, right? Hmm. Interesting, yeah. And I see Phil has his hand up, so I'll, I'll pass off to him. Sure. <laughs> there are also maybe one, sort, one or two people that posted some questions. Um, so, I'll, so I'll be brief. Um, uh, so the, the thing, the, general take home messages that you found is that there is polarization and that in fact the platform seems to um, amplify it through the funnels that you showed and that there is a, this strong asymmetry uh so most of the misinformation seems to be on one side and it's not uh, reflected on the other side and the people who are more susceptible seems to be on that side very, very consistent. So if you look at it at this level of generality, this seems very, very consistent with what we and others have shown on Twitter. Pretty much the same results. These asymmetric networks, most stuff tends to be on the left. There is polarization. So I was wondering if you have, after all this work that you did with Facebook, if you have any thoughts about major differences uh, between, well, I would say across platforms, but at the, at the least between Twitter that you are also, you know, very familiar with, have done a lot of work on that as well, and Facebook in terms of affordances. Do you have any feeling based on the work that you've done as to specific affordances of the platforms that may have an effect on what we observe? Like even the platforms are different. There is no pages and, and groups on Twitter, and yet the result seems to be qualitatively similar. So what do you have any thoughts about 
these differences mm. across platforms? Um, yeah, let, let me uh, sort of footnote here is that, of course, this is only about misinformation, but new, news content, right? So the, the data we analyze in this paper is just political news, uh, which involved analyzing in this paper, only content that contain URLs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe, we don't know, maybe there's an asymmetric pattern when you look at political memes. We didn't look at political memes. We didn't, right? In other papers of the project, you know, we expand the net of the content that we analyze. In this particular uh, paper, everything you said, super accurate, but I want to make the caveat that, <clears throat> you know, this is only about political news, which is a tiny fraction of all the content that circulates on Facebook, because frankly, people are not interested in the news, right? And so it's an open question whether this asymmetry would also appear were we to analyze political memes. Um, maybe then we see this land happening on the left. I don't know. I doubt it. My prior is it wouldn't be that way, <laughs> but we don't know. That's that's the basic answer. Now, as to the differences, I mean, the biggest difference really is, is the user base, right? Uh, I know Facebook is uh, going out of fashion. Young people are not interested in Facebook anymore. Maybe they get more interested now that TikTok apparently is going to get banned. Who knows? Or, or kind of forced to be sold. Um, but way more people use Facebook than Twitter. Um, and but but it's still most of the dynamics we analyze are still driven by a minority. So that's one commonality that I'm very intrigued in. And this is again how much you know the the, the spilling effects, right? How much overlap? If this if part of this is really responding to uh, organized attempts at pushing certain rhetoric or at pushing certain mm -hmm. types of content, if there are really these co covered sort of networks that pretend to be organic but are not really, and I'm talking not about the Russians now, but this is domestic. <laughs> then you know it wouldn't wouldn't it be fascinating to be able to do the i know some papers are, are that have done this cross platform analysis where they look at the platforming on twitter and then parlor and I, I don't think i've seen any papers doing this comparing facebook and, and twitter and it's partly because it's very tricky to make sure that you're tracking the same users but you know i think the fact that it's always a minority right the, but potentially the exposure, the damage is is larger on Facebook, if only because there's a there's way more people using Facebook than Twitter. Um, um, so I think you know the commonality to me, but this is obviously I'm, I'm speculating. I don't know the, the the biggest commonality is human. I think right, like so there's probably a lot of overlap in the users that are posting the most problematic content. Maybe not. We I don't know. In terms of the affordances, um, you know, there's still some differences, I, I believe, in limits on how many, you know, in, in the how, how much broadcasting power you can build on Facebook via v Twitter. Um, my understanding um, is that sort of groups were launched as an afford as, as a surface on Facebook as a way of emulating Reddit subreddits, whereas pages are more kind of intended to emulate Twitter, <laughs> right? In terms of who's allowed to have like a large audience. There used to be limits on how many followers or friends you could have on Facebook that were different from Twitter. And I'm, I'm not sure we have a systematic understanding of all these things matter. Um, so yeah, it's not a very satisfying answer, Phil, but um, <laughs> but it is intriguing that we have these commonalities. And as I said, I mean, to me, the most is, 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 it boils down to this minority, to this committed minority of users who can tip the dynamics of the entire system, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and you mentioned uh, you know, like some people who may have outside influence who are specifically pushing this content on Facebook, this would be pages. And on Twitter, we find similar things. I mean, Matt's work on identifying super spreaders, uh, very similar. There are a few accounts that have really outsized influence. And I mean, I think that they correspond to pages in some sense and on, on Facebook. And uh, so we see that strong um heterogeneity in influence as well yeah yeah but hard to compare like you said so good points thank you uh, by the way <laughs> let me also thank caitlin and matt for organizing uh the series as always <laughs> and matt back to you maybe i don't know if there is time to take any more questions but thanks everyone thank you yeah i, I think maybe i mean sandra if you don't mind me one more question from the sure. chat i'll just grab the last one i think it's kind of interesting um so this is from from Ben. Uh, he, said he said, thanks for the talks. I was I was interested in your point that individual level interventions might not always be sufficient to deal with the uh, MISO level information diffusion problems. So he's trying to understand the, the scope better, like moving beyond the individual level. What do you think um, platform interventions should look like? Like, how do we get away from this if individual level interventions are not kind of the path forward? 
I mean, to me, it's the, uh, the design of the platform affordances, but also the machinery, the algorithmic machinery behind <laughs> how these selection mm. processes happen. And these are the more, most black boxy parts of, of the process, right? Like, um, mm -hmm. uh, I think this is the one area where we would benefit greatly from getting access to all the research that internally these companies do all the time. Uh, I, I thought it was interesting, this other paper that I briefly <coughs> mentioned in one of my slides, the PNAS paper, where they look also at asymmetries uh, on Twitter. They, I think, you know, they, they favoring right-leaning sources. Um, this came from, with for, for, sort of from our collaboration with Twitter data scientists. And I think the conclusion is also, yeah, I mean, we, we have to open the, the black box. So we, we know, and it was a causal design, right? So it's the algorithm that's driving this, but we don't exactly know why, because the algorithm is not this one simple switch that you turn on and off, right? It's a complicated mm. system. And and I, I haven't seen the follow-up. And especially now, I don't I don't have high hopes of seeing the follow-up, right? But so <laughs> to me, that's the key. But of course, you know, these algorithms react to users' behavior. They learn from user behavior, right? And so maybe the, our revealed preferences are not good approximations for what we really want or need, but that's what the algorithms read. Algorithms don't read minds, they read behaviors. And so I think there's a lot of space here to do more research. Um, and, and, and this, but this goes beyond the individual. It's about the system and, and the interactions that take place in the system. For sure. Thank you. Thank you again so much um, for your time, for the really interesting presentation. Uh, I'm particularly really interested to see some of the, the work that you talked about at the end about the information diffusion, because Bill and I are working on some very similar stuff as well. Um, so yeah, please, everybody, uh, thanks, Andrew, one more time, and, and uh, we'll say goodbye. Well, thank Bye, everybody. You. Thank you.